Welcome to The Commute, a Bible study podcast designed to turn your commute into an opportunity to grow in your faith. Whether you're sure of what you believe or you're not sure what to believe, this podcast is designed to help you better understand who Jesus is, what the Bible's all about, and how that applies to your life today. I'm your host, Pastor Matt, and I'm excited to dive into this week's episode of The Commute. Well, hey, welcome to The Commute. I'm Pastor Matt. And I am Pastor Casey. <laughs> and hey, we, I was looking at uh, my podcast app on my phone, and I was scrolling past The Commute. Do you realize this is probably something like our 130th episode of The Commute? It is quite a milestone to have recorded I was, so many. This is pretty cool. Yeah, you know, and it's crazy because, you know, the whole idea behind this, you know, one started as, you know, a Bible study that you all were doing. And then the idea of, you know, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could have a weekly touch point to help people work through their Bible in a year? Uh, so it started just a monologue. And uh, one of the greatest shifts we made in the commute is when we invited Pastor Casey on to co-host. Uh, uh, you're too nice. Because, you know, it's, it's just way more fun. It's way more fun doing things in groups, but especially reading the Bible. And we don't often think about that, you know? We just kind of think like the picture of head down in the Bible by myself, but how much more is gained when you get to sit down and like really dig into it with somebody else. So that's been, I don't know, personally fun for me. Well, it's personally fun for me too. I am a, an out loud processor. Uh, I do think quite a lot silently just in my head, but if I'm going to do really good thinking, it usually has to involve words. So this is an opportunity for me selfishly to work through some of the things that I experience when I read the Bible too. So uh, if, if nothing else, this is a good project for me. I hope uh, somebody else has received benefit from it too, but uh, I'll take it for myself nonetheless. Well, and then uh, Rebecca made a big shift for us uh, without telling us um, during COVID we're sorry uh, we're about this, by the way. What's that? <laughs> we're sorry about this, by yeah, the way. Yeah. We didn't realize uh, the shift that you're about to talk about. Yes. Uh, and so <laughs> during COVID, we had started recording it on Zoom because, you know, everybody's, everybody's separated. And because it was on Zoom, it was also on video. So Rebecca moved us from an audio only podcast to a video and audio podcast. So we want to apologize to whoever started watching that first when we didn't realize we were on video because uh, the people who I, I saw mean, me doing this for 20 minutes straight uh, as I'm looking down at the Bible. Sorry. Yeah. About what that. was, yeah. Well, what was doing, uh, you know, and we're in our like sweatpants and t-shirt phase, right? I think I wore Uggs for like two months straight, like throughout my house. There's definitely at least a handful of episodes where I am like wearing the same pink t-shirt. Um, yeah. So you're welcome everyone. So now we've, we've stepped it up. We, we're on video, but we've got some lighting. We've got, uh, you know, some fun, fancy microphones like this so you get a better sound quality. Um, but it's, it's amazing to see what God's done over 130 episodes. So if you've been with us all that time, uh, thanks. If it's something that you're being blessed by, feel free to share it uh, with somebody else um, because it's always a fruitful thing when you take time out of your day to just like dig into the scripture. And uh, today, we're going to be jumping into the book of Isaiah, because this week you're going to be continuing in John, uh, in Proverbs, but uh, we haven't really touched on Isaiah as much as you guys have been reading it. And I think today is a really fun time to touch on it, because we're doing a bit of a turn. Could you explain to us what that turn is that we're experiencing in the book of Isaiah? It is a critical turn, because... In the preceding 39 chapters, there has been a lot of judgment coming from, from God through the mouth of his prophet Isaiah, judgment on surrounding nations, uh, but even judgment on Israel and Judah. So the book in, in large part may feel like it's got a lot of doom and gloom, and there's a, an interesting section uh, from, I believe, chapter 36 or so through 39 that is sort of a transition out of um, like prophecy or uh, what looks more like Hebrew poetry back to narrative. And it's uh, narrative around the 
the events of the the fall of Jerusalem, uh, kind of a, a important cataclysmic moment in in the history of God's people, where the holy city is besieged and it is uh, eventually broken into and it falls and the people are taken captive. Well, Isaiah 40 then comes and it's a shift back to prophecy. It looks kind of like Hebrew poetry. You'll see it. It's not really in like long paragraphs, but it kind of has like line by line sorts of divisions. And it is a, a, a prophecy that's kind of the opposite of doom and gloom. It is uh, comfort and restoration. And a lot of what you'll see in Isaiah 40 through 66, which is the end of the book, are, are prophecies that are really hopeful and the kinds of things that if I'm, if I'm an Israelite, especially if I'm, I'm reading this in exile, post-exile, I am thinking to myself, yep, this is, this is the kind of stuff I'm going to, to take to the bank and deposit. This is, this is worthwhile stuff for me. That's awesome. I think, yeah, I think that's huge. And that's probably one of the confusing, you know, sometimes the prophets are difficult because we forget that they were written in such a specific context. And they do at times flip from, you know, the poetry to the narrative. Um, so it's really cool to see this, this kind of turn. Uh, for me, the turn's so powerful because I oftentimes talk to people when they read the Old Testament, they're like, oh yeah, that's the God of judgment and doom and gloom and destruction, you know? And here, all of a sudden, you hear these words of gospel, words that, um, I don't know if you brought it up yet, um, but are words you hear in the gospels um, to kick things off. And it's just, you know, God is just speaking. I love how 40 opens up. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended. Like, you know, the Old Testament is not just this doom and gloom, like judgmental God. This, you know, gospel and grace runs throughout the whole Bible. Yeah, it does. And I, and I think it, it speaks powerfully. Like, Im imagine this for a second. You're hearing these words, comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended. Like, these are people who have been at war, people who have been besieged, people whose, whose city, whose home has been destroyed. I guess I'm, what, what's coming to my mind right now is, is thinking like, imagine that, that you are like living out West and dealing with the kinds of wildfires that are happening out there now and the and like the level of, of destruction that has taken place out there. Imagine somebody who has just walked out of that, hearing, yeah. hearing words from God, uh, comfort, comfort my people, you know, speak tenderly to the West Coast and say that, that the destruction is ended. Um, just kind of, that, to me, that's kind of a, a heavy wow kind of moment. Um, and I love that, that the, that the turn kind of just comes, comes like that. It's huge. It's huge. And, and I think, you know, I think too, what, what you also see and when we kind of talked about is, you know, you're also seeing famous opening lines uh, from John in the gospels, which is, you know, a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight uh, in the desert, a highway for our God. So I think you also see this like interconnectedness. So the story of exile and destruction is not just some Old Testament thing for Israel, but it's, it's woven into this bigger story of God that, that he's just kind of like laying out. So like, that's the powerful thing about the Bible is like books of the Bible stand on their own, but they don't stand on their own. They're, they're interconnected into the bigger narrative um, that's happening. And so to, to study the Old Testament, to hear, to hear this comfort, to realize, you know, like, in, like you put it in such a powerful way, the parallel to what it would have been like today is to better understand the New Testament and what's going on in the New Testament setting. Yeah, that's exactly what happens at the beginning of the gospel accounts. This, this moment in the story gets reprised right? Uh, the, the gospels open up, well, not, not exactly, but at the beginning of each gospel, uh, in the first few chapters, you have mention of John the Baptist, who fulfills these words. The gospel authors will 
take Isaiah 43 right here and, and say that John is the one who fulfilled this. So you have, so you have an initial experience of the God's people in the old Testament experiencing exile and destruction and hearing words of comfort and then basically words of preparation in the kingdom. This gets reprised in, in Jesus day as the people of God are still in a sense in exile waiting for the king to come and wouldn't you know it a voice in the wilderness prepare the way of the lord john the baptist um and similarly today we as people of god followers of jesus uh live in in a kind of exile waiting for the king to come again and this is the the story that we replay or we rehearse um all the time, especially in, in the season of Advent. That's where these, these words have a prominent place is in, in that season of waiting and expectation. So we're in a sense living into that same story and making some sense out of our life today with the help of this story that's been replayed in the lives of God's people for centuries. Well, and I love, I love that idea of exile and, you know, hoping in the promise God has, because what you have to remember is, as they're, they're hearing these words of comfort, they're walking into exile. You know, it's not an accident that um, Isaiah has just essentially uh, said, you know, shared this story of, of God's people finally being, you know, Jerusalem finally being destroyed, God's people finally moving full, full time into exile. And then the words of comfort are coming as the people are beginning uh, their time in exile. I think that's a powerful thing because, you know, for us, you know, God speaks his words of comfort in the midst of the trial, not just when the trial's over. And so if you ever have a feeling of being in exile, you know, I, I hear it a lot of times when people kind of talk about like, oh, why is the world this way? You know, how, how come things aren't working out? Why why, why is the church experiencing persecution or suffering or, you know, and, and I think the reality is that narrative that Casey unpacked for you, like living in exile, we have to realize that in the New Testament, that is what they say our reality is, living in exile. And in exile, things don't always go the way you want them to go. But in the midst of that exile, God's speaking his comfort and that promise that this is not forever. Yeah, the experience of an exile is yearning for home. And when you're, you're yearning for home, that takes energy, that, come, that comes with a cost. So to be spoken to by, by a God who can bring you out of exile and return you home and to hear from him words of comfort, um, those are the kinds of things that I think for that I think make for longevity in exile and even flourishing in exile. Um, so it's my, my hope that you all see just how useful these, these words are and that they have something pointed to say to you in, in the time that the time and situation that, that you're living in right now. Yeah, that's, it's huge. I mean, I know, you know, personally, I, I think I've said it before on this podcast, but it's 130 episodes, so maybe you missed it. Um, but uh, I, I've said before, Isaiah 43. I mean, those are words that I heard at a national youth gathering uh, in Atlanta when I was in high school. Um, we're not going to throw a date to that. It, it wasn't, wasn't that long ago. That was yeah. just yesterday. Yeah, it was the late 90s. No big deal. No big deal, right? Um, but, you know, I, I heard those words for the first time at, at a national youth gathering. You know, fear not, I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you walk through the waters, I will be with you. They will not pass over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. For I am the Lord your God. I, I mean, I've, I've heard those words that come out of Isaiah. And those words have provided me comfort in the midst of trials. They've provided other people comfort in the midst of, um, you know, uncertainty and trial before them. And so, you know, it's powerful, the words that God speaks in what would be classified as one of Israel's darkest times. Yeah, they are incredibly useful words. I've, I've seen you use them. I've used them at bedsides for sick people um, or for people who are, 
are grieving and experiencing uh, significant loss. Um, yeah, these, that's what these words do is they, they bring some light in the midst of dark times. Um, so they're, they're worth us dwelling on them and, and continuing to, to use them um, in, in those times as, as they arise in the future. Yeah, definitely. And and this part of Isaiah is going to be way, way better to read um, as far as like a reader goes, you know, you don't want to, okay, none of scripture is horrible to read, but let's be honest, some of it's hard to read. Uh, and, and this part is going to feel a lot better. This is where you get, you know, as you start moving into Isaiah, this is where you'll see the suffering servant text um, that'll pop up for you in several weeks, something that we use like every Easter. Um, one of the most powerful pictures uh, of Jesus and his suffering on the cross um, you actually find in the Old Testament in Isaiah. So there's some great stuff here. I just encourage you, like, you know, lean in. Uh, we've intentionally done this reading plan in a way that if you're stepping in for the first time and, and the Old Testament kind of scares you, um, you know, you've got the gospel right there. So you can listen to that first. You can read it first. Um, the gospel is the New Testament. But you know, that's not our way of saying you should shy away from the Old Testament. Like, I think there's a lot to be gained from that. So um, with that, is there anything else that you'd share for people as they're continuing this journey in Isaiah? Yeah, I would, I would say uh, keep, your, keep your eyes open for a couple other uh, significant chapters. Um, one of them is Isaiah 61. Um, it talks about the, the year of the Lord's favor. And interestingly, this is the scripture that Jesus opens up to the first time um, he goes to the, the synagogue in, in the gospel according to Luke. This is Luke 4. Uh, Jesus gets up and finds the place in the, the scroll of Isaiah. That's Isaiah 61. And he reads it and basically says, uh, hey, everyone, this scripture today has been fulfilled in your hearing. Uh, what you're hearing right now is a fulfillment of, of this scripture. So read Isaiah 61 and uh, go read Luke 4 when you're done. And then some of my, my favorite chapters are um, Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66. Um, Isaiah 65, you get a picture of, of the new heavens and, and the new earth um, of what God is going, going to do um, at, at the end. And thinking about especially like juxtaposing this with, you know, the city of Jerusalem being, being destroyed and uh, the people being taken into exile to have this as a, as a conclusion, I think is an, an appropriate and wonderfully hopeful place to conclude things. Um, and then uh, Isaiah 66, again, to um, just getting, getting a glimpse of the, the new heavens and, and the new earth, um, same, same sort of thing. Uh, it's, that's just one of, one of my, my favorite things because uh, I, I need to be reminded in the midst of what sometimes feels like a very broken and um, very messed up earth that something better than what I'm experiencing is coming and that the, the God who made this has promised to make this new again. Uh, so that sort of like lifts me out of my day-to-day uh, -day mire to see something uh, beautiful and uh, it brings me a lot of hope. That's huge. I, I love that you pointed that out. And then too, you know, you're reading through Revelation right now, see that some of these images from Isaiah, they carry all the way through to the book of Revelation. They totally do. That is an, an awesome connection. So yes, read Revelation too, while you're reading this stuff from Isaiah. Maybe, you know, we're out of time now, but maybe we'll make some of that connection next week. Uh, so I uh, hope you enjoyed this week. Hope you had a chance to, to just understand Isaiah a little better, connect to scripture. Um, if you need other resources, definitely jump on the Bethlehem Church Live mobile app. You can continue watching um, our Faith Over Fear series, um, which we have in the second to last week of that, and the next week will be the last week of that. So check that out. Um, but yeah, uh, we're, we're pumped to see you next week. So join us next week right here on The Commute. Thanks for checking out this episode of The Commute. For more information on The Commute or to join the Commute Bible Reading Plan, simply download the Bethlehem Church Live mobile app or go to Bethlehem Church Live slash The Commute.